Hello everyone and welcome to the Cyclical Investors Club YouTube channel. My name is Corey Kramer and today we're going to have a different sort of video than I normally put out. Um, I was recently asked the question, um, why do I focus on cyclical investing instead of like dividend or dividend growth investing? Well, I'm going to put the dividend and dividend, dividend growth investing off to the side for now and just talk about um, how I got started investing in cyclicals. Um, I think that's, and then we'll all talk about dividends and dividend growth, um, the positives and negatives of that strategy in a different video. Um, there aren't too many people who focus on cyclicals as one of their core strategies because they're very difficult to do. Um, but I'm going to explain, which is good for me because there, there's just not too many people that do what I do. Um, but let me explain how that came to be, kind of the story behind why I ended up doing this. Um, it started off with a really pretty bad mistake. I mean, it wasn't, I've made worse mistakes since then, but this is the mistake that got me into like cyclicals. So back in a little bit more background, I invested in individual stocks back in the early 2000s. And then I started um, my own business and became a writer. And I did that until basically my daughter was on the way in 2008. She was born in 2009. And we bought a house during the crash in 2008. So a lot of my extra money or all of my extra money went into buying that, which was good because it was cheap. But um, so it was really after that, that I started having kids and I opened accounts for them to invest that I started buying individual stocks again and getting into buying individual stocks in 2009, basically, um, when the market crashed, which was a good time to start buying individual stocks again. Um, so I had been buying individual stocks just as like an individual investor, from 2009 until 2015, which is when I started writing about um, stocks. And I was in graduate school um, from 2013 through 2015. Um, political theory is actually what I studied in school. So which which, play, which is relevant to what we're about to get into. So because a lot of that research and combined with my interest in investing kind of all mixed together to sort of create what happened. So. Um, there was a company, an oil, um, I don't know what they call them, oil drilling, okay? Oil driller called uh, Helmerich and Payne. They've been in business for over like 50 years. They paid dividends for a long time. And this is what their earnings looked like when I bought the stock. I want to say it was early 2015. Actually not sure that I knew earnings were going to decline as they did here when I bought it. But I want to say I bought it right around this time period. The stock price was about, let's just see how far off the high it was. Stock price was 50% off its high, okay? It yielded about 4% dividend. And I want to say they paid a dividend for like 50 years or something. I could be wrong about that. Maybe it was 20. But it all looked pretty good. And the PE was, I want to say it was, yeah, like 11 or 12 it looked pretty cheap when I bought it, maybe even 10. It probably looked about more like that because I don't think I knew earnings were going to come down at this time. And it all looked good. I mean, it looked easy. It looked simple. Um, you know, it looked like a no brainer to me at the time. Um, and I ended up losing maybe 30 or 40 percent on it or something like that. Um, and so this is what actually happened after I bought it to their earnings and price. So I was buying around here and then we have this horrible down cycle basically until there was a little bit of uptick in 2019, but really it wasn't until last year that these guys really earned any money again. Um, so I, I wanted to figure out what I got wrong. I didn't hold it this time. I wanna say I sold maybe somewhere down in here like, I don't even think I held it a whole year, maybe. Maybe I maybe I got into here into 2016. But 
I just didn't understand what the heck happened and what I got wrong. So I was really committed to figuring out what I did wrong so that hopefully I wouldn't make the same mistake again because it looked like super just like a layup and I got like killed on it. And that's when I started studying like cyclical businesses, which these guys have. Now this was more of like a super cycle. Um, so it was even more exaggerated than, than normal. But um, it led me to, I think the first book I read where anybody really mentioned like this type of cyclicality was Peter Lynch. So I don't have his first, this is his second book, um, One Up All Street. It was actually his first book that I read called Beating the Street. I couldn't find it. I have it laying around here somewhere, but I have just piles and piles of books everywhere. So it's, and I had it out the other day looking up a quote or something. Um, so I couldn't find it. So Beating the Street, and you, when you read in there, cyclicals is one of the categories of stock that Peter Lynch would invest in. And he had a really good, brief, you know, plain language explanation for how they work. And he used Ford as his example, um, as at least one of his examples. He probably had more. So that was when the light bulb really went off to say, okay, this is what I got wrong. Earnings, these earnings can fall a lot. Now, this example was a really dramatic example, but um, I realized what I had done wrong. And then I realized a lot of people were doing this wrong because I didn't really see anybody ever write about this very much, except for a sentence or two sometimes where somebody will just say, well, this is cyclical, blah, blah, blah. But nobody really ever explained it. So during the same time, like I said, I was just finishing up graduate school with my master's degree in early 2015 or mid 2015 um and i i ran across a book i bought a library sale it was a george soros book and i bought it for like a dollar and i read it and in the back it had this strange appendix where he goes into this concept of reflexivity and how basically these cycle that that's what forms some of these cycles sometimes in the market so there's a whole um, Wikipedia thing you can read on, on it. Um, but basically what happens is these feedback loops form where, you know, if you have that price of an asset and it rises um, and then you take money from it and you reinvest it again, um, that can cause the, the asset price to rise even more and then it feeds off each other and it can form these big cycles basically. Credit cycles work like that. I mean, there's a lot of other cycles that work like that. But the full write-up um, that Soros did, which I bought later, was The Alchemy of Finance. And I want to say, I haven't looked at this for a long time, I want to say he gets into it a little more detail in that in that book. Um, and this is when he was investing like back in the 60s. So that crossed over with my political science stuff because um, Soros based a lot of his investing theory on Karl Popper who, if you do any kind of social science statistics or um, kind of, I don't know, experimental design or whatever, um, then you, you study him and you, so, so there's a, some overlap with like kind of what I was doing. So I, I, so at that point I kind of understood theoretically basic, these basic earning cycles. Um, and that made me feel a little bit better. And then I wrote my master's thesis. I combined on a guy named Edmund Burke. This is the actual thesis there. Conservatism, Burke, and durable independence. So the durable independence is more my philosophical thing. Um, but if you're interested on Edmund Burke, you can go to the Wikipedia thing, which I'll pull up on him too. But this is a pretty good book about him. I think he gets misinterpreted a lot, which is one of the reasons why I wrote um, you know, my thesis on him, but I was really impressed by Burke's ability. I'll pull up his page here. So he was a statesman, politician, I guess, in around the time of the American Revolution, basically, in the British House of Commons. Um, he's, whereas Soros today is kind of known as a kind of a more left-wing political figure, Burke is known as the founder of conservatism. So in some ways I put the two of these guys together, um, at least in my thinking when I was kind of developing this. Um, what I found, was, so I, I've read all of Burke's works and probably half of his personal correspondence, which is a lot. Um, 
and what I noticed was he uh, he had a very very great understanding of history and when he would make arguments he's often known as for his rhetorical abilities but when you look at the structure of his arguments um, he would usually start with some historical example perhaps some context behind it and then use that to try to move on to whatever argument he was trying to make but what i found really amazing was he was right almost all the time i mean nobody hardly ever listened to him <laughs> so he wasn't successful necessarily in too many policy changes but he ended up being correct um in my view a lot of the time um, most of the time relative to any other person i'd ever read you know i just felt like he not only one of the reasons i think he's known for making rhetoric good rhetorical arguments is because he ended up being right um so i guess if you're right then your argument in retrospect is pretty good not always but you know it looks better in hindsight um so i understood that like history you could actually learn something from from looking at history and then being a social from the social science field i understood that markets really are a social phenomenon right people are making individual decisions that ultimately at a, at a macro level which burke really understood he understood that there's so many of these tiny decisions being made in society that um you, it's you don't want to use a theory to predict how people should how things should be structured they you really need to have them be practiced in then observe what actually happened right um because there's so many different factors that you know history ends up being like the best guide so you don't want to deviate too much from it um, some people call him conservative um i think he just respected that history gives a clearer picture of how human beings and mass will behave more so than some prescriptive um, a priori theory that were very popular at the time. So, and again, in my view, I think he, he's right. So when I take that and I apply it to stock investing, um, I found that history was very predictive, especially when you put a few extra parameters on it you know, of the types of cycles that would happen again in the future because human beings haven't changed very much. And since, you know, um, the past couple hundred years at least, uh, markets haven't really changed fundamentally that much. Um, so I put the history together with the reflexivity and the market cycles, and that got me gave me the theoretical basis and then the practical basis was just going back and doing research, looking at historical drawdowns, just working on the businesses that I knew it worked for and didn't I didn't never felt like I needed a universal cyclical theory. I only need to get enough stocks out of all the ones that are out there to make some money off of. So I started putting this in practice when I started writing for Seeking Alpha in 2015 and I took, um, I think I put out five of these ideas in 2016. So I worked on this pretty hard through 2015. I had written a couple just kind of generic articles to see if Seeking Alpha would actually pay me if I sent them in an article in 2015 because I was, I was done with graduate school. And they did, and then I was thinking about this theory. And then so in 2016, I actually started really putting out the cyclical articles um, and I think, if I remember correctly, four out of the five produced a 100% return. I think there was one semiconductor slash solar related business. It was a very small cap. I had one like 3D printer, one FM, FMC, I think was one, FMC, yeah, whatever the chemi uh, chemical company is. I made a um, video on them recently. That was a 100% return. And I think I had another one that I'm, that's escaping me right now. Um, and then one, a generic drug maker was a loser. So on that initial batch, I had a few more that I invested in myself that I didn't write about, but, and then looking at the historical data, I could see like, you know, four out of five times I was getting like doubles within a couple of years, which are very good returns. And so 
it was just a matter then of just keeping working on it. And then I expanded into other um, area, other strategies and things because what I found was the really there's maybe like a hundred deep cyclical stocks that are high enough quality that you can have confidence you're probably not going to lose a ton of money four out of five times. Um, and that the gains, you can probably get like 100% return four out of five times within five years. Um, so when you do the math on that, it works out really well. Um, the main problem is the universe of stocks, which I didn't know at the time. Um, I, even when I started the Cyclical Investors Club, it wasn't until you know, maybe six months after I started it when I had time to do more research and I actually built spreadsheets and stuff where I was like, well, there's like 70 of these maybe or 60 at the time that I had found um, that met all my standards that had that high probability return, which is good, um, but they often all fall at the same time. So you get this big clump of um, declines and then um, when they recover, the theory doesn't really have a way to predict the tops of these cycles. So my method is always, well, it's more of a social thinking about it. It's, well, the market w was willing to pay this in price in the past, so there's reason to believe if it wasn't like a super cycle like this one these guys had, um, they would probably be willing to do that again in the future. Um, but I didn't really have a way to predict what would happen after the market was making new highs again, right? So it's really, a, I just try to stay within the boundaries of the, of the theory, and I usually sell pretty close to when they're making new highs. Um, and so what would happen is you would have a big clump with a bunch of opportunities, like 2016 was pretty good. That was kind of the industrial recession at the beginning of 2016. Um, but, in af but after that, by 2018, I was writing a lot of warning articles about cyclicals, about how far they could fall, right? And there was a down cycle in 2018 that I was able to buy a few, but the Fed came in and kind of put a bottom under it. So it wasn't like a recession, you know, and kind of the same thing happened in 2020 with its own mix. So there hasn't been like there, there's been some investment opportunities, but not a whole lot. So that's why I try to develop, you know, more strategies as time went on. Um, and I've added those to this one. And so this one's now maybe. 25, 30% maybe potentially of a portfolio might end up being cyclical, like deep cyclicals, and then the rest are other types of strategies. So that's how I came up with a strategy. That's how I got into it. Really just analyzing a mistake that I made, combining it with some different theories that nobody else was using because I'm not a finance person. I, well, I am now, I guess, but I mean, I, was, I certainly wasn't then. So I had a different perspective and I was able to just put that together and, and apply it in a way that not too many people did. I mean, Lynch did it in the 80s and 90s. It's not like it's new, really. Um, but I think, you know, not too many people do it. It's very difficult. Often your stocks can fall an additional 50% after you buy them. So yeah, you really have to believe that they can come back. It's not a short-term strategy. It's a medium-term strategy. Um, it's also not a long-term strategy, so it's not easy. It's not like buy and hold most of the time. There are a few you could do it with, like Caterpillar and Deer, but I mean, usually with cyclicals, most of the time you do want to take your profits. So it never really fit all the easy things that people want to do, right? Nobody wants to buy a deeply volatile business that has a one in five chance, if you're doing your job right, of going bankrupt, we'll call it, or close to it. And and then when you get your profits of 100% or 150%, you really have to take them and you can't just hold on and, you know, declare victory forever. Like if you bought some, some if you bought like Coca-Cola in 1987 or something. So, so there's a niche for it and, and, and that's how I ended up doing it. So I'll post some more of these videos and people just ask me general questions about theories and different strategies. Um, I've never actually, I've written about this in the Cyclical Investor Club service, but I've never uh, made a video of it, so it was pretty interesting. All right, thanks for watching. I'll see everybody later. Bye.